Now that we've had practice writing skeleton equations, let's go ahead and take our next step in writing what are known as balanced chemical equations. So remember in a chemical reaction where atoms are never created nor destroyed, we simply break bonds, rearrange the atoms forming new bonds, and must balance the equation. So in every balanced equation, each side of the equation has the same number of atoms on each side. So the same number of atoms on each side of the arrow create a balanced equation. Now in our notepads, we're going to be asked to summarize the rules for balancing an equation. I'm going to show them one step at a time, read them through, and then share with you what I would do to summarize those statements. There will be a total of six rules or guidelines, suggestions for making balancing equations a little bit easier. And again, this is a skill that just takes practice. At first, it might seem a little difficult, but the more you do it, the more insight you'll gain and the quicker you'll become. Rule number one when balancing an equation. Determine the correct formulas for the reactants and products in the reaction. To determine the correct formula for the reactants and products in the equation. What I'm suggesting is we're only as strong as our nomenclature. If I can't write a correct chemical formula, I'll never get my equation to balance correctly. In our notepads, rule number one, write this with me. Determine the correct formulas for all the reactants and products in the reaction. Stressing the word formula knowing that we're only as good as our nomenclature is strong. Once I determine the correct formulas, where I have positives electrically balancing the negatives, crisscrossing charges, listening to prefixes, knowing how to write my acid formulas, all of those skills that will never go away in chemistry. Rule number two. I'm going to read it through. Don't feel so overwhelmed. I have a shorter way of saying it. Let me read it through first before you start writing. Write the formulas for the reactants on the left side and all the formulas for the products on the right side of the arrow. If two or more reactants or products are there, separate them with a positive sign, a plus sign, this and that. When you've finished, you have created a skeleton equation. What would I do to summarize this? Write a skeleton equation. And we've practiced that with skill from our first section. Rule number one, figure out your correct formulas. Rule number two, in balancing an equation, put the reactants on the left side, the products on the right side, separate them with an arrow. If there's more than one reactant or more than one product, we put a plus sign between them. And what we end up having is a skeleton equation. Rule number two, write a skeleton equation. Rule number three, count. Let me read it through. Count the number of atoms of each element in the reactant side and on the product side. If a polyatomic ion is appearing unchanged on both sides of the equation, count it as a single unit. If the polyatomic ion on the left side and on the right side of the arrow remains unchanged, just count it as one thing. Rule number three, count. Write that with me. Count. Count the number of atoms on each side. What we want to do is to know how many of each atom do we have on the left side compared to the right side. And if a polyatomic ion is there unchanged on both sides, count it as just one thing. Summarize this rule into your notes. Rule three, counting. Count the number of atoms of each element in the reactant side. Compare that to the product side. If your polyatomic ion appears unchanged, count it as a single unit. Rule number four. Let me read it through for you. Balance the, chem balance the elements one at a time using coefficients. The 
large numbers that will go out front of reactants and products, coefficients. Never change a subscript to balance an equation. How tempting that would be to balance an equation, but it will create an inaccurate balanced equation, so that's a no-no. Balance your equation using coefficients, rule number four. Rule number five. Check each atom or polyatomic ion to be sure that the equation is balanced. Rule five, check your work. The nice thing about balancing equations is you absolutely know if you have a correct answer if you can count. Count the number of individual atoms you have on the left side, compare it to the right side, and simply check your work. Rule five, check your work. Rule six, we must, must make sure that our coefficient ratio is in the lowest form possible. Reduce to the lowest form possible. Just as in our subscripts for ionic compounds when we crisscross, they have to be in the lowest ratio possible. Coefficients follow that same rule. Make sure you're in the lowest ratio possible. There are six rules to balance an equation. Rule number one, make sure you have the correct formulas. Rule number two, write the skeleton equation. Rule number three, Count. How many of each atom do you have on each side of the arrow? Remembering the polyatomic tip. If you have polyatomic ion, the same on both sides, count it as a single unit. Rule number four. Place coefficients in front of reactants and products to balance your equation. Rule four. Place your coefficients in. Rule five. Check your work. And rule six, be sure that your coefficients are in the lowest ratio possible. Six guidelines or suggestions to help you become good at balancing equations. Let's try some. Here are some practice examples found in our note pack. Practicing examples of balancing equations. Now when I look at these, these are skeletons already. Rule number one, make sure your formulas are correct. Well, they're given to us, so that step is taken care of. Rule number two, write your skeleton, where the reactants are on the left side and the products are on the right side. This is taking care, and care for us. So we're, we're already picking up at step three where it says count. So the skill here is simply counting and learning where to place coefficients. And when I do this, I use a t-chart to begin with. And this is a strategy that most students in, in beginning balancing equations, they really, really find it helpful. To create a t-chart, I simply say, what are the elements on the left side of the arrow compared to the elements on the right side of the arrow? And I tally them. So I'm noticing that I have a silver, an AG, so I'm going to end up counting an AG. Write this with me in your margin. I have a polyatomic ion called nitrate, NO3. Notice how it's appearing the same on both sides of the equation. I'm going to count that as a single unit. There is a nitrate polyatomic ion. I have the element hydrogen, and I have the element sulfur. There are four different things that I'll be counting or bookkeeping for from the left side to the right side. Tally with me. How many silvers do you count on the left? I count one. How many do you count on the right? I see two of them with that subscript. The group of nitrate, NO3, I see that there's one polyatomic ion on the left, and I also see that on the right. I see two hydrogens on the left, and I see one hydrogen on the right. And the last element, sulfur, I see one on the left, and over here I see one on the right. 
My strategy is to just start at the top of your t-chart and keep placing coefficients until it all works out. For no other reason than it's written first, I start at the top. I notice that silver has one on the left, two on the right. I'm going to begin by balancing my silvers by placing a coefficient in the line provided by doubling. Now take care of the t-chart. Not only have I doubled the silver, I've also changed the quantity of nitrate. Two distributes through the entire compound. There's two AGs and two units of the polyatomic nitrate. Repair your t-chart. The silvers look good, so we go down to the nitrate. Nitrate, I have two on the left, but one on the right. I'll use my coefficient to balance the nitrates by placing a two in front of the HNO3. Repair your t-chart. Not only did we distribute the nitrate, repairing it to two, but we also placed in a two for the hydrogen. Two H's and two units of NO3. And now look what's happened. Everybody's balanced by having the same number. And this is the check your work part. Two AG's, two NO3's, two H's, and one S on both sides of the arrow, we have indeed balanced our equation. And the two to one to one to two stoichiometric ratio or mole ratio, coefficient ratio, all those words mean the same thing, is indeed in the lowest ratio possible. Not so bad. Let's try number two, bookkeeping first. We're going to tally. What do we have on the left side? What do we have on the right side? Creating a t-chart. I notice that I have an MN, which is called manganese. I'll be tallying for manganese. I have oxygen on the left, so I'll just write that in as O. I have an H, and I have a CL. So again, four different characters, four different atoms that we'll be counting. On the left side, I have one manganese, two oxygens, one hydrogen, and one chlorine. Just counting those elements on the left side of our arrow. Same strategy over here. We have one MN. Here's one, two, three, four total chlorines two H's and one oxygen. Create your t-chart that is simply counting the number of atoms that you have on both sides of the arrow. For no other reason that it's written first, I just start at the top of my t-chart. Since the manganese looks fine, they're both counted as one apiece, I come down to the second. The oxygens are not yet balanced. Two on the left, one on the right. Where do we find oxygen in the right side? Well, here it is in a water. If I need to balance, I need to place a two in front of the water. Repair the t-chart. What does that affect? We have two times two is four hydrogens. And two times one, while well, we have twice the number of oxygens. We have MNs balanced. We have Os balanced. Who's next in the t-chart? Well, it looks like hydrogen. Four hydrogen on the right, but only one on the left. We can repair that by placing a four in the HCl. Repair your t-chart. What is it talking to? The four distributes through the whole compound. So we have four hydrogens and four chlorines. We have indeed balanced our equation, haven't we? Checking your work, one MN two O's, four H's, and four CL's, and we are in the lowest ratio possible, a one to four, one to one mole ratio. Throwing a word out, stoichiometric ratio, next chapter. Should we try some more? Number three, zinc hydroxide reacts with phosphoric acid, producing zinc phosphate, and water. Now here I'm going to show you a strategy that I like. It helps me balance so easy in a double and in a single replacement reaction. Here's what I'm noticing. On the left side I have zinc and hydroxide, hydrogen 
and phosphate, the polyatomic ion. Do you recognize the pattern of change? We're just still exploring it. We got time left to kind of get good at this, but we're starting to explore what are known as double replacement. Zinc went to phosphate. See that product? H went to OH. HOH is commonly called water. But I got to tell you, this strategy I'm about to show you makes balancing awesome. Let's rewrite water as HOH in terms of the two ions that it's built from. Hydrogen ion, hydroxide ion. Water, written in terms of its ions, allows me to count H and OH separately and it really helps me balance an equation beautifully. So now we're going to count on the left side. We have zinc, Zn, and the polyatomic ion hydroxide. I am not going to separate O's from H's. I'm going to leave that polyatomic ion the same. Notice how it's the same. Here's the OH. Here's the OH. It's appearing unchanged. Count it as one unit. Now over here I have hydrogen. Notice how it's unchanged. Hydrogen in terms of H and in terms of H. I'm leaving water separate and I can now count that as just a single hydrogen hooked to the polyatomic ion known as phosphate. Now let's count. On the left side I count one zinc. On the right side I count three units of Zn. On the left side I have two OH groups. And on the right side I have one, one unit of an OH group that's contained in the water. On the left I have three hydrogens. On the right I have a single hydrogen in the water. My polyatomic ion phosphate, PO4s, there's one unit of PO4 on the left side but I see two units of PO4 on the right side. This is where our tally has brought us. Starting at the top for no other reason than it's written first, I shall take care of the zinc ions first. Since I have one zinc on the left and three on the right, I'm going to start by repairing the zincs. Three ZNs. Fix your T-chart because you've changed more than just the zinc. We have three ZNs, repair the T-chart, but now we have also affected the number of hydroxides, the number of OHs. Two times three now gives me a total of six OHs. Three zincs, six OHs, I've repaired the T-chart. Zincs are good, go down to the second character, OH, hydroxide. Six of those on the left, only one on the right. I'm predicting a six in front of my water. Repair the T-chart because now we're not only talking to hydroxide, we're talking to the hydrogen as well. Six H's and six OH's. Let's repair both of them in the T-chart. Now what do we have? Zincs are good, OH's are good, on to the hydrogen, the third character. Three on the left, but six on the right. We need twice the number. Let's double H3PO4 and repair your T-chart. Three times two gave me six H's and one unit of phosphate doubled. Now gives me the two we wanted. We did it. A three to two to one to six ratio. The lowest ratio possible and we've checked our work using a T-chart. We know our equation is balanced with three ZNs, six OHs, six H's, and two PO4s. I like the strategy of separating water. If you see water being formed by the combination of H to OH in this double displacement reaction, separate it out and it makes the counting so much easier. Let's try a next one. CO with Fe2O3 forming Fe and CO2. Start with your T-chart. What do we have so far? And this is just margin work. We have to count carbons 
oxygens and irons. Carbon, oxygens, and irons. So let's go to work. I see one carbon on the left. Total of two O. Oh, excuse me, two irons. And we have one plus three is four oxygens. So count it on the left. What do you have on the right? I see one iron, one carbon, and two oxygens. All right, so we counted. Step three, we counted. Carbons look fine, so I'm not going to choose to start there. Let's try the oxygens. Well, the oxygens, four on the left, two on the right, so I can get that to repair itself. When I do that, I'll start by placing a two in the blank in front of CO2. Alrighty, so let's repair the T-chart because now all of a sudden we've we've not only repaired the oxygens but we affected the carbons. Here's two and here's four. Hmm. We're getting into something that I'll share a little trick with you, but here's what happened. I repaired the oxygens, but then I have to back the bus up and fix the carbons. All right, we can do that. Carbons, there's two on the right now, but only one on the left, so I'm going to just go ahead and repair that. Here's a two. Two carbons, fix that, but darn it, what happened? One, two, three, four, five oxygens. Seems like every time I go to fix the oxygens, I affect the carbon. I fix the oxygens, I affect the carbon, and I run into this this um, loop where I can't fix it. I'm going to share with you a strategy. And the strategy, 99% of the time, is going to work for you. If I go back, and, and what I'm saying is, I have this continuous loop problem. I fix my carbons, but I change the oxygens. Let's suppose I go here and I change the oxygens and I'm going to affect the carbons. This is the trick. Remember what we did here, how we placed the two and we placed a two. Twos did not work. Here's my, tra uh, my trick, my strategy. Instead of a two, what's the next biggest number? What's, what's the number after the number two? Well, it's the number three. Here's my trick. Instead of twos, try threes. Try it. Let's, now, let's just go back and repair the T-chart. I'm going to repair the T-chart, having my initial number still counted. Alrighty. So I didn't erase my initial count. But instead of twos, and that's where I started, because I started by repairing oxygens, it didn't work. Go to the next biggest number. And now let's count. We have three carbons on the left, three carbons on the right. That looks good. Oxygens, three times two is six on the right, and three plus three is six on the left. Hmm, I like it. The twos didn't work, go to the next biggest number, and we have one last repair, and that's to get the irons. Our ratio, 3, 1, 2, 3, balance that equation. I've shown you two tricks so far. Trick number one, HOH for water, dreamy. I like it. It works. Here's trick number two. When I get this little stuck spot, I repair one element, but it changes the other. I go back and fix it. It affects the other. And you get into this thing that goes, holy mackerel, I can never get this to work. Stop. Go back and go to the next biggest number. Instead of a two, try a three. Notice what happened? It worked. One more to try for skeletons. Number five. Iron three chloride with sodium hydroxide made iron three hydroxide and sodium chloride. Let's do some tallying. You probably have more margin room. I'm just going to erase, give myself some room. Just find a spare spot room that you have to create a t-chart. Left, right, here we go. We have iron to tally for. We have some chlorine to tally for. We have sodium and we have hydroxide. Polyatomic ion, leave it together. I see it unchanged. See it's OH here. 
There's an OH here, count it as one thing. I have one iron on the left. I see three chlorines on the left, one sodium, one hydroxide. On the right side, I have one iron, three OHs, one sodium, one chlorine. So we counted. Iron is written first for no other reason than it's first. That's why I always start. The irons look good. Leave them alone. How about those chlorines? Well, I can see that I'm going to need to repair the chlorines on the right side. So I'm going to start with a three. Repair your T-chart. Not only have we changed the number of chlorines, we've changed the sodiums as well, giving us three units of Na and three units of Cl. Irons are working, chlorine's working, on to Na. One on the left, three on the right. We'll put a three. Three will repair the sodiums, and something else has happened. It repaired the hydroxides. A one, three, one, three, pretty straightforward. NaOH, FeOH3, giving us three units of NaCl. One, three, one, three. Not so bad once you use this T-chart. Let's keep going because I'm going to show you examples where we have to start from scratch. Um, gaseous hydrogen. I have to put those into a skeleton form. So I'm going to start. I always like to put a blank. Gaseous hydrogen belongs to one of those lucky seven diatomic, so H2. Reacting with solid sulfur. So I'm going to put my line so I remember where my coefficient will go, forming aqueous hydrosulfuric acid. Hydrosulfuric acid based on charge H2S. Gaseous hydrogen with solid sulfur forms aqueous hydrosulfuric acid. There's our skeleton. Something nice has happened. Do you see it? I think it came out balanced. We have H's and we have S's in this combination pattern. Two H's and one S on the left. Two H's and one S on the right. Based on charge, not because I just squished them together, but based on charge we ended up with a balanced equation. Awesome. Aqueous iron 3 chloride with aqueous calcium hydroxide forms solid iron 3 hydroxide and aqueous calcium chloride. Boy, our nomenclature skills coming out to test us. Start with a blank where I know my coefficients will go. Iron 3 tells me it's a plus 3. Chloride, negative 1, FeCl3, aqueous plus aqueous calcium hydroxide. Put a blank there. You remember where the coefficient goes. Just good habits. Calcium with its plus 2. Hydroxide carries its minus 1. So we crisscross and we'll end up with Ca parentheses OH taken twice. And it is indeed aqueous forming solid Iron 3 hydroxide, iron with its plus 3, hydroxide minus 1, crisscross, little s for solid, and aqueous calcium chloride. I'm going to have to squeeze mine in. Perhaps you're writing smaller. Ca, Cl, we have a plus 2 with a minus 1, so when we crisscrossed Ca, Cl2, and we'll finish that with a little Aq for aqueous. I like to put a little line so you remember where the coefficients go. Let me be quiet a minute. I'll just be quiet. Try it. Try balancing. Use a T-chart or just count in your head. See if you can get an answer. Go. Maybe you're there, maybe you're still working. 
There's one iron. I like that. There's three chlorines on the left, two on the right. One calcium on the left, one on the right. Two OHs, three OHs. So with your T chart, and I'll have to erase this, but I'm running out of spare spot room. When you counted your irons, your chlorines, your calciums, your hydroxides, you started with one iron on each side, three chlorines to two chlorines, one calcium on each, and two hydroxides compared to three hydroxides. We have this situation, three and a two. I know the lowest uh, ratio that they'll turn into is a six. So perhaps you started, as I will, with my chlorines. Three on one side, two on the other. I'm going to have to turn them both into sixes. So I'm going to do that by putting a two in front of my iron. And I'm going to come over here and place a two. No, right here, here it is. A three, turning my chlorine into a six. So we have three calciums and six chlorines. So I repaired the chlorines, but I disrupted the irons. So I'll come back here, place a 2 in front of iron hydroxide. 2 times 3 now gives me 6 OHs. What else does this to do? How about a 3? Three, 3 calciums and 6 OHs. Did you get it? I hope so. 2, 3, 2, 3 balanced that double displacement reaction. Iron went to hydroxide, calcium went to chloride. The pattern of chemical change, a double replacement. I have to erase my t-chart, make room for my next problem. Solid carbon, so let's show that. Solid carbon reacts with oxygen from the air. to form, that didn't come through well, to form gaseous carbon monoxide. Carbon monoxide as a gas. One carbon, two oxygens, one oxygen. Are you getting good where you can just spot them with your eye? We have to double the oxygens to get them to balance, two O's, and then repair the carbons. If you t-chart this, you counted carbons and oxygens. Placing a total of two on both sides, I think we balanced with really just kind of a spot check. Easy enough. Combination. Element combines with another element to produce a single product, carbon monoxide. Aqueous silver nitrate. Aqueous silver nitrate. Silver with its plus one, nitrate with its minus one, AQ for the aqueous, dissolved in water. Reacts with solid copper. Cu is the symbol for copper in its solid form. To produce copper to nitrate, that's a line for my coefficient, copper now with a plus two, see that Roman numeral? Nitrate, still a minus one. So now I have CuNO3 taken twice, and I'll put that little AQ for aqueous and solid silver. AgNO3 plus copper produces CuNO3 taken twice and solid silver. A single replacement pattern. See how the copper is kicking out silver? Element plus a compound made a new element with a compound, a single replacement. In our t-chart, we are going to count silvers, nitrates, and coppers. I see clearly just one of each on the left side, one copper, one nitrate, one silver. However, I see two nitrates on the right side of my arrow. Well, the silvers look good, but the nitrates will need repairing. So I'm going to start by doubling over on the left side to repair the NO3 group. Fix your T-chart. Instead of one silver, there's now two, but the nitrates are now working. 
To repair the silvers, we come back and we double the AGs. And look, checking our work, two silvers, two nitrates, one copper, an A-plus answer, a single replacement. And one more to complete our set of, of examples. Let me give myself some room. We'll start with aluminum metal, AL in a solid form, little line for the coefficient, reacts with oxygen from the air. So we know that to be O2, molecular oxygen, in its gaseous state. To form is the arrow and we have solid aluminum oxide. Now don't just squish these, think about charges. Rule number one, boy oh boy, you're just going to be so sad if you just squish those and it won't balance correctly. Think charges. Aluminum oxide, correctly written with its charge, Al2O3, an ionic compound built of charges. Now we go back to balance. We have a left side, we have a right side, we have to count aluminums and oxygens. One aluminum on the left, two O's on the left. Two aluminums on the right, three O's on the right. Now for no other reason than it's written first, I usually start with the first one, aluminum, and I would start, and I will, I'll end up erasing it, but I'll start with a two there, get the aluminums to work. They're good. But now I have a situation where the oxygens, I have a two on one side and a three on the other. I got to turn them both into sixes to get them to actually be equal numbers. So to return them into sixes, I have to triple the oxygen and I have to double my product. Two times three is six. And even though I knew this was coming, I always just start at the top. I have to go back and repair my aluminums, don't I? Because now, by doubling that, I actually turned it into a four. Easy enough repair. Was a two, but now you end as a four. And now, we've balanced our equation. You've done a great amount of work today. I'm so proud of you. You've balanced equations. You've practiced your skeletons. We have a practice sheet that uh, we will now turn in or turn our attention to practice sheet due for tomorrow and simply balancing equations. Let's go to work.